about factory coupling, but uh, in a second I'll show you how, how it works. Uh, we talked about field enhancement, which is possible uh, in this uh, nanoparticle arrays and about optical uh, nonlinearity. And so we talked a lot about the uh, exome, the milk, and the tubes to the values uh, not really available in natural materials. So now you should understand all these concepts, and that's the picture uh, of the composite from the previous lecture. So uh, actually, uh, you probably already seen this slide, and for, for many people, the plasmonic optics start with this work uh, published uh, uh, by uh, Epson in, in the, about extraordinary transitions. It's not from this paper, actually, it's from, from, from the other paper uh, from 2002, but the, the idea is uh, more or less the same. We made uh, smaller, uh, small holes, arrays of small holes in metal, and look at the uh, transition and see that the transition is much higher than you would expect uh, uh, using just only uh, uh, geometrical optics considerations. Uh, if you look at the, uh, uh, the response, you can see resin here. And this resin is governed uh, by uh, this kind of equation. It's one of the explanations, there are quite a few others, but, but that's one of which works pretty well. Where the plasmon uh, uh, wavelengths is coupled to the uh, wavelengths of the incident light through the uh, inverse vectors of the, uh, of the gradient. Uh, of this gradient. Uh, why this work was uh, uh, so popular, it's, it's difficult to understand, uh, because there, there was works like that before, uh, believe me. But it sometimes requires, uh, how to say, ignition to produce something good. And in a sense, it was uh, very interesting, because you can have uh, various resonances and various properties of the, this kind of structure. Play with the nanostructures inside, uh, you can change this property. That, that's why I think uh, that, that's the uh, generated from the cosmonic optics. So uh, I introduce you first of all what is the difference between the surface running and surface localized uh, plasmons. Uh, I will not go in nuance, but uh, if you uh, have a piece of metal, then at one side of the metal uh, there is a solution uh, to electromagnetic equation, which would be evanescent uh, here uh, in the area over here. And this uh, solution is natural, so it belongs to the solution of Maxwell equation uh, of this situation. So if you can uh, throw the light, which would have exactly the same k vector as this solution, you would have strong absorption. And uh, that's the surface uh, running plasmons. And it's difficult to excite this surface running plasmon. There are basically two uh, most used geometries. That, that's a Frenchman geometry, and there is another one, it's called the geometry. The reason why it's difficult to excite, because the k vector, k -vector of this uh, running plasmon is high, is larger than the uh, k vector of the light. So you need to enhance the k vector using the uh, prism which produces large K over there, and then you can couple to, to the surface running plasmons. And there is also surface localized plasmons. Uh, and uh, you probably have seen that in the previous slides. It's basically vibrations of uh, uh, electrons in the metal uh, inclusions of the very small size. And fortunately, they also uh, can have uh, a strong resonance, a strong absorption. Uh, and the difference between those two uh, situations is that it's much easier to excite uh, surface localized plasmons and more difficult to excite surface running plasmons. On the other hand, uh, the properties of the surface running plasmon are more uh, interesting than the properties of surface localized plasmon, plasmons. Uh, we'll discuss that later. I asked you a question, uh, if, if you remember, at the end of the lecture, how many molecules would be in between these two uh, particles uh, of air if it's under normal uh, conditions? Does anyone calculate? Did anyone try? Okay, I'll, I'll give you the answer. It's actually about 100 particles. So it's not that much. It's actually a vacuum in between those two other particles. And that changed a lot of things. For example, the uh, electric discharge between these two nanoparticles would be completely different. It would be electric discharge just from a uh, big wire. And for example, plasma, uh, electric plasma, which could be produced in between those, would behave completely differently. So that's a good topic of uh, investigation. Okay. Uh, in the, as, as I said, localized plasmons in many respects better because you can excite them easier, but in many respects worse than the running plasmons because their resonance is even uh, wider. And there was a big paper uh, in uh, his letters uh, where people uh, try to persuade all other guys that it's a general property of individual particles to have wide resonances. 
Uh, the reason for that is pretty simple. If you calculate the absorption, uh, which happens in this nanoparticle, you just basically have to calculate gel uh, uh, heat, and it turns out that for quasi-classical approximation, where you can say that the electric field is always the same inside the nanoparticle, everything cancels, and you, you'll be left with uh, uh, electric permittivity and its uh, d, e over the omega. So, uh, uh, that, that was the arguments of this paper. And actually, if, if you remember this uh, slide uh, from the previous paper, or from the previous talk, you can see that the uh, plasma resonance, localized plasma resonance, are pretty uh, uh, wide. So it's about 200, 100 nanometers. Uh, Anti-symmetric one, uh, quote, or narrow width, uh, just because the radiation uh, losses are smaller. Uh, to, to these uh, resonances, normal symmetric resonances, you would have additional contribution from dipole radiation. Uh, not for those one, but it's still about like 70 uh, nanometer uh, width, or probably 100 nanometers. And uh, it's possible to have better resonances in silver, for example, uh, uh, like 50 nanometers, but silver is not the material which lives long. So you can make a sample, uh, it could live one week, and then you can throw it away and never use it again. As far as gold is concerned, you can make a sample and after two years or three years put it into a different uh, uh, situation and it will still work. So, um, uh, if we now change the geometry to inverse, uh, remember the first slide where you put holes uh, inside the gold uh, layer to the uh, dots are uh, placed on the glass of spray. Uh, then you would have a localized plasmons in each of the dots. Okay? And then, uh, actually, you can uh, try to uh, couple these uh, plasmon resonances by using diffractive mode. So instead of running plasmons, uh, remember K, SPP was over there, uh, we can uh, use the uh, just diffraction and try to couple the uh, localized plasmons which will be in, 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 in all these dots. And actually, in this case, the, res the resonances can be much, much narrower uh, because uh, we'll, we'll see why uh, in, in, in a second. Uh, the, the, the good example of that is one-dimensional array of nanoparticle. It was suggested by Professor uh, Professor George Schatz uh, quite a long time ago, uh, probably five years ago. Uh, and uh, uh, some calculations were done uh, by Vadim Martin even, even earlier, but he did not uh, notice that uh, it's an interesting phenomenon. So basically, the idea is pretty simple. Uh, you've got an uh, array of nanoparticles. And then you throw a light, which is in this case S polarized on these nanoparticles. And then you try to calculate what kind of field would be excited over here. To calculate the field, basically, you need to sum all the dipoles produced by these nanoparticles and the field from these dipoles produced on this nanoparticle. And if you do the summation, I said that there would be no formulas, but I have to use a couple. Uh, you would have a formula, something like that. The polarization would be uh, the susceptibility of one sphere, and that's the most important term over here, it's a dipole sum of the old fields produced by other standard particles. If there is no other standard particles, we would have just response of one uh, uh, small standard particles, and a uh, small standard particle which would be over here. And then uh, you can calculate extension, co extension coefficient, which would be like something uh, connected to this uh, polarization. And you probably can guess uh, what uh, uh, Schatz and Martin uh, suggested to do. They suggested to look at this denominator and say, okay, what happens when alpha s times s equals 1? In that case, polarization will be infinite. And because polarization will be infinite, extinction will be infinite. And uh, they actually, uh, the, this guy calculated the uh, wavelengths range in which that would happen, and it turned out he write to the formula that it should be actually uh, exponentially uh, 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 narrow. So if you, if you look at that stuff, it's, it's almost zero under pro proper conditions. So you can have as narrow uh, resonances as possible. So that's the theory. Uh, I'm not a theoretician. Uh, I actually prefer experiments a bit. So I, I'll show you a picture which, for me, works much better than the theory and one over one minus uh, alpha s. So if, if you look at diffraction gradient, and you throw a light on the diffraction gradient, then you would have zero order of diffraction. But also, in addition to the zero order of diffraction, you would have other diffraction orders. And if your one of diffraction order lies alone in particles, then it would see a lot of lot of nanoparticles and could be absorbed quite strongly and could interact with the plasmon resonances which, which can exist in these nanoparticles. So that, that's the whole idea of, actually of, of all these calculations, is to show that when a diffractive mode is grazing, so that when it goes along the uh, nanoparticle array, 
uh, it produces uh, strong absorption. And, and that's basically the whole idea of the uh, narrow resonances. Because if you look again on this structure, uh, the uh, accuracy with which you can, uh, the amount of nanoparticle with diffracted base is depends on just a geometrical factor. So basically the size of the nanoparticle divided by the distance between nanoparticles. And that would be the smallest anything. Okay, so, but before going into discussion of the experimental bit of the NAS, I, I have to say uh, that the uh, particles arrays do not exist without substrate. So it's only in theoretical papers you can see nanoparticles like lying by you. Uh, it, it never does, uh, never do that. So basically you need a substrate where you put these nanoparticles. And that leads to uh, phenomena called uh, wood anomalies uh, uh, in, in arrays of metallic dots or uh, in, in the case of wood, it was published like in 1902. Uh, uh, it leads to a, a very narrow uh, and uh, strong uh, absorption uh, of the met. Uh, so the, the, the uh, experimental structure was like that. It was a diffraction grating on which you put a metal. So uh, in this case, it was connected to the uh, running plasmons, but uh, the, the connection was through the uh, uh, a vectors which we discussed before. So actually it's probably the first plasmonium optics experiment uh, of that type. And there are two types of wood uh, uh, anomalies. And the relevant one, the interesting for us, was explained by Raleigh as the disappearance of diffractive mold in the substrate. And uh, Professor Russell mentioned quite a few times Rob Relay. And I, I, I would say if, if he would be alive today, we wouldn't have a lot of problem with the explaining about uh, what happens with the nanoparticles and stuff like that. So basically the idea was pretty simple. If you've got a diffraction mold which goes to grazing uh, situation where it goes like along the uh, substrate, then it cannot propagate inside the substrate because the material condition for wave propagate in air in a substrate completely different. You would have uh, epsilon times mu uh, in this equation. So this mold cannot go inside the substrate, so it should disappear. And as soon as it disappears, all other modes will be distributed. Absolutely the same happens if the mode uh, would go from the substrate to the air. It cannot do that again, because the uh, material condition for wave propagation here and here is completely different, so the mode should disappear again. And in that case, that's called relay uh, substrate mode, and that's a relay part of uh, uh, air mode, I hope. Okay, so... Um, uh, we'll talk about uh, wood anomalies in arrays of gold nanodots. Uh, I'll try to show you a picture of uh, how, how it works. So, uh, this is actually the sample. Uh, this is a source of the light which falls on the sample. Because the period of the structure was like 270, 300 nan nanometers, which is less than the wavelength of the light, you need to have an angle. Uh, to throw light and to see a uh, diffraction over here. So if you throw the light under some angle, then you would have diffractive mode going backward. And then if you look at the diffraction, it would look something like that. And if you uh, make a better picture, you would see that there is a mode where the light just disappears. And there is another one over here, which you can't see. So that's the basically the uh, wood anomaly and the uh, relay cutoff, uh, ha which happens at relay cutoff uh, frequency. Wavelengths. And if you compare this with uh, what wood done, it's not a big difference actually. It just nowadays we've got colored structure and the period is a bit smaller, but the physics is more or less the same. Okay, so what we use to, to measure this uh, uh, structures, we use so-called uh, variable angle spectroscopic uh, episodometer, uh, which is wool on one, and which pretty good, which throws the light of the structure. Uh, the light reflects from the structure in what you measure. Uh, you measure the uh, ratio uh, of the electric field of p-polarization over electric field of s-polarization. And there are two electrometric parameters which describe this property. Okay, then uh, the psi gives you the ratio of the intensity of rp over rs and delta phase uh, shift gives you the uh, amount of phase shift between p and s uh, reflection light. Then we just measured reflection spectra using a uh, uh, spectrometer, standard one. And we obtained this, this kind of results. So if you take a, a single particle array with the separation of 320 nanometers and the size of the dots about like 120 nanometers, 
you would see a very narrow uh, uh, resonances at the approximately 600 uh, uh, nanometers, and it's pretty close to the relay or uh, cutoff wavelengths. Uh, you can see also very bright and very strange and strong changes of phase, uh, which happens uh, at exactly this uh, wavelengths, cutoff wavelengths. You, you see this thing only in P light, which is exactly the, the same uh, polarization where Wood observed his, his an, uh, anomalies. And strangely enough, you see nothing uh, in the absorption uh, in the uh, extinction spectra of these uh, uh, nanoparticle arrays. And the reason for that, because the Wood an an anomaly is far away from the plasmon resonance. The plasmon resonance in this case is about uh, 700 nanometers, and the Wood an an anomaly is about 600 nanometers. So to have an absorption uh, 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 resonance, what we need to do, we need to match the plasmon resonance, local plasmon resonance with the uh, of the relay cutoff wavelengths. So we've done that by using uh, uh, double kilo arrays, which we've seen uh, quite a few times uh, now. And uh, again, we see very nice and narrow uh, resonance connected with the uh, uh, relay cutoff wavelengths. We see jump of the phase uh, at the, the same uh, position. We see very narrow resonances in reflection as well, but now we see a very bright and uh, very narrow resonance in the absorption. The uh, uh, quality of this resonance is, is about 100, which is um, much bigger than uh, anything you can have uh, with the uh, localized plasmon. And the reason for that, that this uh, width is not because of the uh, localized plasmon, but because of the coupling. The coupling happens only for this wavelength, which is not far away from the relay cut of wavelengths, where the wave is grazing. As soon as it's not grazing, doesn't see a lot of nanoparticles, and we would have no uh, response from the uh, two-dimensional array. Uh, so uh, uh, that's another picture of uh, uh, the narrow component resonance. Here, the width would be something like uh, 10, uh, half width would be like 5 uh, nanometers. And uh, there are also some features over here which corresponds to the substrate uh, uh, related of wavelengths. Another uh, feature which corresponds to uh, higher mode of uh, uh, relay wavelengths. And uh, it's again the picture of this double pill arrays. And uh, if you look over here, it would be a, a reflection spectroscopic parameter as a function of wavelengths and angle. And now you understand why we see that Brewster angle. Remember, I told you that there are two Brewster angles somehow. Uh, the reason for that is because we've got very narrow resonance connected with the uh, uh, lo coupling of localized uh, uh, resonances through the diffraction uh, mode of the light uh, observed on the gradient. The most strange thing about this stuff is the fact that it goes through zero. Uh, if you do mathematics, you would see that uh, this uh, is not artifact. Uh, the actual electric field uh, goes through zero exactly over here. And you can see that from the phase. If you take a uh, uh, derivative of the phase, and calculate how much it would change, like each one nanometer, you would see a strange peak at, at the wavelengths where the electric field goes to zero, which should be the case. Uh, jump of on pi for, for, for the phase of the light which goes to zero uh, uh, electric field is, is pretty known phenomena. Light of the uh, which goes to the focus of the uh, uh, lens uh, change uh, his uh, electric field phase on pi, or at plus angles, uh, uh, the phase is changing on pi, and so on and so forth. Uh, so uh, we also measured the extinction as a function of angle and as a function of the wave wavelengths and, and the angle. And uh, you can see that these resonances are observed only at pretty high angles of uh, incidence. They disappear as soon as the angles become uh, pi, oh, sorry, zero. It's possible to make uh, structures for which it will still work at uh, zero angle. Uh, I will not go into, into reasons why, but uh, that, that's the case. And if you plot the uh, uh, wavelengths of the relay resonances, you, you can see that it follows uh, actual, so that's the reflection uh, as a function of angle, uh, sorry, wavelengths and angle again, for different periods of the uh, structure. And you can see that it really follows the formula, I think there should be some formulas over here, for the relay cutoff wavelengths uh, in substrate and, and, in, in, and in air. And we also plotted the dependence of the half widths uh, of these resonances, that's the resonance actually in absorption, uh, as a function again of uh, with, I think, angle. And again, you can see that there are 
quite a small numbers of the over here. It's just, as I said, five five uh, nanometer widths of the resonance you can have. And again, it's I think it's pretty good. Uh, so that's the general formula for all uh, relay cutoff wavelengths, and that's our best result so far. Uh, update on the different structure, which I will not describe you, but uh, it's uh, 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 about like 3.5 or 3 nanometer widths for the resonance observed in this structure. And again, it's metal. For metal to have such a sharp uh, uh, resonance is, is great, because you can do whatever you like with that. You can make sensors, uh, you, can, you can make switches and, and stuff like that. Okay, so why double dose? You, you already noticed that uh, there was a lot of double dose in my talk. Uh, and uh, uh, the main idea of why we use double dose because uh, they have plasmonic resonances which are easy to manipulate. You can tune them to values of which are not easy to achieve just by changing the size of the dose. And uh, you can say that it's because in yin yang uh, you, you've got uh, symmetric things and anti-symmetric things between those. I can be fancy and say that uh, I've seen it the first time in Hanya Mudras, there is a sign for. Uh, uh, yoga, uh, when you think about nature, and that's actually infinity sign, it's both exactly the same thing. Or you can say it's just because of uh, all the glasses, and everything would be right. And actually, uh, the, the first guy who introduced double dots uh, into plasmonic was Professor Crane, and uh, uh, he, uh, when I asked him why he decided to study two, two uh, nanoparticles, he said, okay, everybody knows what happens with one, so the next obvious thing is to use two. And it turned out that even for two you can have many interesting phenomena. Okay, so to conclude about uh, who, who, who uh, 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 anomalies, it's pretty interesting theory. There is no much theory uh, yet on that one. Despite uh, I give you an introduction that there is some theory, it is actually uh, not correct theory for, for the simple reason they did not take into account all diffraction modes. And there is another problem with the theory, uh, because uh, when you describe propagation of light, it's more or less easy. Uh, you take retarded green, fi green function and then calculate everything using it. But if you do in nano fields, uh, uh, near fields, it's much more difficult, because you don't know what kind of green function you need to take. And uh, it's still an open question how to describe these resonances. Uh, another interesting question, how small we can make uh, the resonance widths. So, can we make something as small as laser? Uh, that, 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 that's a good question. Uh, another pretty good question, what determines the amplitude of the resonance strengths? You see, it drops almost to zero, and uh, it's still not clear how we manage to do that. It's just experimental result, but uh, what uh, parameters we need to change in order to get that experimental result? It's, it's, a, good, it's a good question. Uh, these uh, resonances are pretty sensitive to environments, so now we're measuring what happens when we put something on the top of, the, uh, of this nanostructure, how they would shift, how they compare with the uh, uh, phase-sensitive SPR, which is surface plasmon resonance technique for measuring the properties of something uh, in nano, uh, uh, nano uh, volumes. Or uh, you can make so-called nano SPR where you use plasmonic resonances to see the local index of uh, uh, diffraction. So, uh, also, uh, there is another thing where this phenomenon can be useful. I, uh, for example, there is a big problem how to make space. Uh, uh, it's a nanolaser where you've got pumping of the uh, uh, photons into the uh, near field cavity. And the trouble is, the near field cavity, as we discussed, is broad. And uh, it brought us to all three lasers where the uh, cavity got very narrow molds and very nice. But using that kind of coupled uh, uh, resonator, if you if you use like hundred of those, you can produce very narrow uh, 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 response to the external excitation. So that probably would solve uh, the, the problem of matching the of, okay the, the leaking of the platforms uh, from the uh, cavities. So that's uh, the end of the part connected with the uh, uh, narrow resonances. And from narrow resonances, we'll go to uh, wide one. So we'll talk about plasmonic black body. And again, it's a fancy name, but uh, you, you will understand uh, uh, why uh, it's called plasmonic black body. Uh, I think that, that that's a cliche, safe, safe choice. 
Okay, uh, using uh, uh, nanostructured gold, we can make gold of any color. Believe me, if, if I take a gold and structure it, like for example with stripes, here it's just a striped gold. You can make gold of magenta color, green color, uh, red color, or probably not, not seen very well, but that's the red color uh, very well. So you can uh, manufacture gold which would have plasmon resonances in the place you would like to have. Uh, the question is, uh, so that's another example of the unstructured gold, and that's another example of unstructured gold. Uh, and the question is, is it possible to produce gold film which would absorb all light that falls on it? And uh, why we ask this question? Because recently there was a big paper, uh, I mean, uh, okay, big story, about graphene nanotube uh, laboratory. So basically what, what the guys did, they produced a, a, a live array of nanotube and showed that in this case, uh, this uh, a live array of nanotube can absorb almost all light that falls on it. Uh, in a sense, it's easy to make something which would absorb light. For example, metal absorbs light very well. But the trouble is, as soon as you've got something which absorbs light well, you would have a big mismatch between the impedance of air and the impedance of the material on which the light would fall, so you would have huge reflection. So actually, metals, instead of absorbing light well, they reflect light well, and all mirrors, all mirrors are done from metal. So, uh, what the guys suggested, they suggested to choose a material in which M can be manufactured to be very small, pretty close to the M of the air, and then uh, by adding some small absorption, which is like at the level of 0 0.5, 0, 0.5, they, and taking very long uh, lengths over here, like 100 microns, they managed to trap and uh, absorb almost all light that falls over here. So. That, that was pretty neat, but the trouble is uh, this thing is very unreliable and it's easy to uh, uh, smudge it away and it's very fragile. So, and there is a saying that whatever graphite can do, plasmonics can do better. So, if you look at the Fresnel coefficients uh, for the, just a layer of something placed on some substrate, it turns out that there is a uh, numbers of n and k which gives you almost total absorption of light for almost any thickness over here, strangely enough. So uh, people knew very well that you can make no reflection easy uh, over here. But the fact that this thing can absorb all light uh, was known but not discussed a lot. So there are some constants N and K over here which gives you almost 90% of absorption of the light. But the trouble is, this N and K uh, are not available natural materials, this N should be 1.2 and K should be 0 0.4, it's, it's not easy to make. So that's where gold and other structure comes into play, because playing with geometry, we can create effective media which would have almost any N and K you like. So we've done this structure, we choose glass, made a PMMA mask, and then just deposited gold, and it produced uh, arrays of uh, like lines uh, at the bottom and lines at the top. It looks a bit like what Professor had told you. And if you uh, measure, uh, uh, so that the experimental structure, uh, which was done uh, in, in Manchester University, and uh, the, that, that's the typical size. Uh, the, the whole structure got about 200 or 200 microns, so it's uh, almost big enough to see by naked eye. The grading constant is still 320. And the width of the stripes changed from 100 nanometers to 170 nanometers. And if you look uh, at the reflection and two different polarizations for this structure, you can see that for one polarization it behaves exactly like gold. So that's a typical gold reflection. But for the other polarization, uh, the reflection is pretty low at the level of about like 5% or 10%. But in the visible light from here to here, it's about 5%. So that's how this uh, structure looks in TM light, and that's how this structure looks in T light. You see, it's not homogeneous yet, but we, 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 I'll show you later a bit better uh, structure. And now uh, that's how the color of the structure changes when you change polarization. So it's uh, the same optical image of the structure where you rotate polarization from this direction to this direction. So, and the transmission of the structure is zero as well. We shall see it uh, in a second. So that's the reflection for different B. So that's small b, that's like half uh, of the distance equals b, and that's uh, uh, large, uh, large b. And that's transmission, you can't see that 
because it's about 140 nanometers uh, on average uh, goal, it uh, doesn't transmit light at all. Uh, so, uh, if you measure the spectrum uh, of the reflection uh, for, say, different angles, it's pretty high angles actually, from 45 to 75. The structure I've showed you, the images of the structure was a zero uh, angle of incidence, normal incidence. You can see again that it reflects about 5% of the light over the whole wavelengths of the digital spectrum, which is pretty unique for one polarization, and if you look at the other polarization, uh, it behaves more or less like gold. It reflects almost 80% uh, and here 30% angles. So from 0 to 75 degree for T polarization, it's the, the, the structure absorbs almost all light that, that fall, falls on it, which is pretty neat. So you can write some theory about it by calculating the effective constant using um, Petri uh, suggestions. And then uh, you would arrive to some effective N and K for parallel component, uh, which gives you pretty good uh, uh, description of what happens uh, in this particular case. So, a uh, possible application of this active reflection, uh, of this structure, of course, something uh, for, for the solar cells, but uh, it's useless to use gold for solar cells. Uh, we actually demonstrated the same behavior can be achieved not only with gold, but with silver, just Gold was done by EPM lithography, but the silver nanoparticles were produced by deposition from the two different sources, and it still worked pretty well anyway. Uh, should work for copper as well. Uh, uh, it's because of nature of electrons in these materials. However, an interesting challenge is the silicon. Uh, so, would be, would, is it possible to make silicon uh, uh, to achieve black body behavior? Because that's what, what, what the most important question. Can we make silicon structure to transfer light to the place where it would produce electrons, it, it, it's an open question. Uh, so with that, uh, I, I think we will we'll stop for, 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 the, for the break. Other questions? I have a question. So this structure, plasmonic plasmonic, as you demonstrated, uh, you know, uh, for many years people have used uh, uh, metal stripes as polarizers, yeah. right? And uh, I'm wondering if, uh, you know, it's something similar here. There's a new language invented in terms of, you know, modern plasmonics language, or uh, is there something fundamentally different? No, no, I don't think there is a something but that. But that's the trouble with all this field, because uh, most of the stuff was discussed probably by relate. I don't know, but uh, here, uh, what, what is the difference with the polarizers? That it really absorbs everything inside this 140 nanometers. I'm not sure if it, 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 it could be exactly the same with polarizers. And also, it does in very, uh, say, wide the, the wavelength range. I'm not sure if it, 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 it would be the same with the polarizers. Actually, it's more or less... It would be the same. Yeah, because those polarizers are completely aftermarket. Yeah. It's, it's probably more or less the same. And if you would retain to you observe the amount of No, actually it's, it's a bit more different. Uh, actually this structure of biofriction, so it's, you can, if you play with that, you can have uh, lambda or you can draw a line instead of uh, uh, the linear polarization at the end, you have separate polarization. So you can do some polarization on this, so using the entire structure, but they have some I agree completely. It's probably fancy language for the more Are there more questions? Yes. Uh, let's see. I'm very, very clear. You, you have mentioned that you have the you see the angle for um, for this structure, and you have varied in using the of the It's varied in this way or this way. Uh, what do you mean by this way or that way? Uh, if, if you look at the, that's, that would be the structure, that the angle of incidence, and it goes like that. Yeah. So this is your
uh, in your plasmonic uh, black body, you uh, just uh, design one dimensional. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, have you ever tried uh, two dimensional structures? Not yet. Uh, why? Sorry? Why? Uh, it's a good question. <laughs> you can't do everything. <laughs> but there is some good reason. Uh, no, no, I, I explain you why, actually. There is some good reason why almost everything we've done uh, got anisotropy. Because in that case, it's easy to check if you've got proper behavior. Because for one polarization, you've got one effect, for the other polarization, you've got another effect, so you can compare that. And if you would have the structure which would behave more or less the same, it would probably not be that interesting. But when you know the properties at which it, it, it happens, uh, it's probably easy to, to make. It's, it, it would be no problem whatsoever to make that structure. It's just a uh, dot, dot square dot inside and uh, the deposition, and you would have more or less the same for both polarizations. Another question is uh, why, why, I was, why, why did you say that uh, uh, it's useless to use gold to uh, find in solar applications? Yeah, as far as gold is concerned, it's nuisance. So we need to go to black silicon, and that's where we're trying to, to do it. So as soon as you know that you need to produce this kind of N and this kind of K, it's just a matter of how you can arrange that from, from silica. Uh, why gold, silver, and uh, copper is like different to all other materials? They've got the electrons, uh, and uh, there is an interbound transition. And actually, all the, the wide wavelengths at which this structure operates because of that. So it's not through the uh, electrons which gives you the effect. Uh, I'm probably talking gibberish, but you, you, you should understand that, that there is some uh, physics involved why we choose like gold. Uh, and uh, for silica, it's, it's a bit dif different, but I think it's possible. So I think it's possible. So sooner or later, right? Thank you. More questions? Uh, if not, let us thank our speaker. And uh, the idea, I think you understand already, is pretty simple. You make some structure, none of those, and then you put it everywhere you can think about it. And uh, uh, these are probably the best thing where you can put uh, uh, another structure, uh, uh, the material. Because uh, if you look at the typical planetary installation, uh, you would have laser light uh, which goes into the sample and uh, if you tightly use the light you can travel inside but the trouble is the uh, volume of it in which you can trap the light would be defined by the wavelengths of the light and it would be pretty large so it makes it difficult to trap small particles they try to escape from, from, from this kind of big light and uh, if you think about nanodots uh, because they provide a uh, much tighter volume of concentration of the light uh, you can think that they can provide you much better uh, tracking uh, efficiency. So I, uh, we already heard about the uh, miscarriage of justice about uh, Ashton, who did not have a Nobel Prize for uh, discovering the traffic properties of the light. And that's probably one of the main uh, which happened uh, during the years. And that's a picture from the Air Science paper, which shows how the the nanoparticle can be put into this volume and trapped uh, inside the tightly focused calcium beam. Uh, actually, most of the uh, nanoparticles which can be trapped should have n larger than 1. And if n less than 1, then we have some trouble, because in that case, a uh, particle will try to repel from, from, from the uh, center focal uh, point. But anyway, so that's the typical uh, optical tweezers. Uh, and, um, uh, the nanometric optical tweezers is something different. The idea was first produced by uh, uh, Novotny in uh, this uh, kind of paper. And what they suggested to, to, to think about, uh, they suggested to think about the metallic needle with the area over here about 10 uh, nanometers or something. And then if you throw the light on this needle, they show that there is a distribution of electromagnetic field which allow you to trap particles over here with pretty good accuracy and pretty good efficiency as well, because the field near the metal are enhanced uh, very much. So uh, th that was their calculations from, from, from this uh, paper, and they showed that the trapping volume can be very small, and the efficiency of trapping can be very large. 
So that's the idea. But unfortunately, to make a needle as small as that and as long as that, as that, it's not easy. So uh, instead of using needle, we decided, what the heck? We've got our double particle array, so why not to use them for uh, nanotrapping? Uh, and uh, when you calculate the fields uh, which arise uh, when you throw the light uh, from the nanoparticles over here, uh, it turns out that it's pretty well confined uh, in between nanoparticles. Uh, these calculations were done for 1.6, uh, 106 uh, laser, and uh, it shows you that you can have trapping volume over here at about like 20, 20, 50 nanometers or something. Uh, because it's trapped in this direction, if you look at the distance over here, it's 100 nanometers, it means that the, in the other direction it should decay. Uh, uh, that's the uh, uh, evanescent photons, or virtual photons, is, is in, in many respects different from ordinary photons. If you take ordinary photons, uh, with, when it propagates, it would diverge, and you have probably all know uh, diffraction limits for everything. There is no diffraction limit for some strange reason for evanescent waves. Uh, if you look at the slices of the uh, evanescent field as it goes further away uh, from the nanostructure, it still has the same 100 nanometers of weight field drops a lot. But the uh, distribution of the uh, light over here is still pretty well uh, uh, fixed and pretty well tight. And I mean, it's 100 nanometers. And the, the, the reason for that is pretty interesting. Uh, if you look uh, at the uh, uh, ordinary light, which is uh, placed in some volume, uh, the diffraction is caused by the fact that you compress light to some volume. So if you do Fourier transform, you will have some other k larger than uh, this k, so it will allow light to go out of the structure. But for evanescent wave, uh, this additional case only means that you need to increase the z component, which decays pretty fast uh, from the surface. So actually, all diffracted light decays much faster than the light which do not decay. And that's the reason why the trap is still pretty good uh, far away from the surface, like one micron from the surface, surface it still would be 100 nanometers uh, on a trap which is over here. It's uh, uh, in complete difference with the uh, diffraction optics, which is nice. Okay, so uh, that's the uh, picture how, how it works. So you put an objective, then you put uh, some oil uh, in, in this objective. You, you take your substrate uh, with the uh, nanodots uh, double dot array over here. Then you track the bit and move the bit to, to, to the nanoparticle array and study what would be the properties of this trapped particle when it moves uh, along the relief of the nanodots uh, over here. And uh, probably the best picture you can produce when somebody professional do this picture. Uh, and uh, that's the Gaussian beam. Uh, that's the uh, two nanoparticles, uh, and, oh, sorry, two gold nanoparticles. And that's the bit which we track. It's, it's about 200 nanometers. And when you move beam uh, along the nanoparticle array, at some point it stops shining on these two nanoparticles and will be shining on these two nanoparticles. So the trap here disappears and the trap appears over here. So at some point the beam will jump from this position to this position. And if you move, for example, laser light from this position in this direction, then at some point this would not be a trap and the trap appears over here and nanoparticle, now oh, whatever, the beam will jump from this position to this position. So you can move uh, along the array uh, using the trapping forces of these uh, pretty strong uh, uh, near, near field traps uh, and looking at jumps of the particle from one uh, stable state of equilibrium to another stable state of equilibrium. So uh, that's how it looks actually. So if you move uh, your nanoparticle far away from a structured substrate, the position of the nanoparticle corresponds to the position of the focus. So whatever you displace the uh, focus, at the same distance, uh, the nanoparticle uh, uh, moves. Oh, mi microparticle, if it's one micron, uh, it will be microparticle. But if you move your focal uh, beam uh, to the position of the uh, nanoparticle, so the distance over here would be like one micron or less. In that case, you, you can see a completely different picture. The bit which trapped would move in jumps, uh, and the, the, the accuracy with which it stays in the jumps is very good. It's about 100 nanometer or even less, actually. And uh, it's a pretty repeatable procedure. You can move it forward, you can move it back. Uh, there is some hysteresis in the jump for uh, obvious reasons, but it's still a uh, very, very, very nice uh, uh, ladder over here. 
So uh, uh, what the, this tells us that it's possible to trap nanoparticles better if you put them uh, at the position in between uh, uh, two uh, gold nanoparticles over here. So we've done this experiment, so we choose uh, one 200 nanometer bit over here and measure the Brownian motion of this bit. And uh, the actual displacement was pretty high. And that's actual measurement uh, when the particle was far away. The focal beam of uh, uh, laser tweezers installation was far away from the surface. But when we move this focal beam closer to the surface and position the bit exactly uh, at the uh, double dot uh, nanomolecules, the Brownian motion shown in red over here is much more tight. And if you, uh, if you produce uh, uh, the distribution, Ga Gaussian distribution of the jumps, which happens over here, you can see that over here we will have in the beginning, far away from the surface, about 400 nanometer uh, average displacement. And uh, as soon as we put it near the two uh, dot nanoparticle, we would have about 40 uh, uh, nanometers. So it's 10 times increase in the uh, positioning of the particle or suppression of the Brownian motion. So actually, we can now take another particle and uh, place it over here with another beam with the accuracy of about 20 nanometers, which is not bad for, for the wavelengths of about 0 0.06 uh, uh, micrometer of the laser used in this uh, ex experiments. So then how to measure the quality of the nanotrapping? Uh, there is a usual procedure. So you, you, you take uh, your nanoparticle, oh, sorry, the nanobit, and then uh, take the Gaussian beam and move it with some speed uh, uh, inside the oil. And then because of the drag force, uh, you would have uh, some force which pull uh, uh, particle back, and you would have some traffic force which, which pull the particle forward. And at the equilibrium, uh, this traffic force should equal to the uh, drag force. And there is a pretty known expression for the drag force, uh, which is called slow. Uh, at some speed, uh, the trapping force would not be enough to keep particles, and the particle would escape from the trap. And that's called escape speed. And uh, by measuring escape speed, you can actually measure the maximal trapping force possible uh, in your particular uh, installation. Uh, in case if you've got a substrate, the situation will be different. Uh, because now, uh, in addition to the uh, drag force uh, produced by just uh, 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 liquid, you would also have drag force due to substrate. Some liquid would stop over here and would not like to move uh, with the uh, particle over there. So actually, the, there is a coefficient of, uh, which re uh, recalculates the stokes force in the case when particles move close uh, to the substrate. And actually, this coefficient can be large. It can be twice or thrice larger drug force over here. Actually, as soon as A equals to R, it comes infinite because it, it would stuck to the, uh, to the substrate uh, nanoparticle. But still, it allows you, by measuring the escape speed to, de to determine trapping force produced by the, by the laser uh, in, in this particular case. So uh, I repeated all this formula. So escape uh, uh, force, which is trapping force, would be uh, calculated through the escape speed. Uh, that gives you the quality of the trap, uh, which is basically the force of the trap uh, divided by the power produced by laser, and uh, there is escape uh, speed dependent on the power, which in our case was somehow uh, displaced by you know that we don't understand yet. But uh, uh, in, the, in the slides of uh, Professor uh, Russell, we also see that there is something there. It's not just directly proportional to, to E. So uh, if we plot now the dependence of the uh, behavior of the big nanobit uh, as a function of the distance from the uh, uh, from the surface of, of the glass substrate. For the absence of the dots, you can see a drop uh, in the escape speed, which is obvious because this k increases a lot. But we see a completely different picture if we do the same thing near the nanostructure substrate. So that's for uh, six uh, micrometer bit. And the blue uh, points over here corresponds to increase of the escape speed for the uh, nanoparticle moving near the uh, 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 array. Let's call not nanoparticle because we've got uh, gold nanoparticles and bit. Let's call bit bit without nano uh, at, uh, and uh, anything. So if you take 200 nanometer bit, uh, which is pretty small, uh, it's again far away from the nanostructure and on the glass substrate the escape speed drops when you go closer to the substrate. 
But uh, if you do exactly the same thing near the uh, nanostructure, you can see that the escape speed increases a lot. So which means that the trapping force increases like uh, uh, 10 times over here and about 5 times over here. And if you uh, calculate V escape divided by the power, that would be something proportional to the quality of the trap. And that's the graph produced here for one micrometer bit. And you can quite clearly see that uh, it grows when you close from the when you go from far away from the surface to close to the surface from like 10 to 400, in 40 times increase in the uh, escape speed we observed near the structure, which is completely counterintuitive. So we go to something which should drag your particle and stick your particle to something, but instead of that, this something allow particle to propagate with much bigger speeds. And we also investigated the dependence on the uh, size of the nanoparticle uh, in the nanoparticle pair. So for the smaller size, we've got small uh, increases in the uh, escape speed, and there was like some resonance structure where the uh, uh, escape speed was the maximum, and it was actually at about 120 micrometer per second. And if you take into account that everything was done in oil, which was uh, uh, viscosity about I think a thousand times larger than in water. Uh, you can imagine how fast it is. Actually, uh, without nanoparticle substrate, it's almost impossible to move uh, these bits. The, the speed was pretty slow, and you need to be very accurate and very tedious with the moving bit. But close to the nanoparticle array, no problem whatsoever. You just pick up the bit and move it easily uh, whenever you like. So uh, I'll try to show you some pictures how it looks like. So that's the uh, 200 nanometer bit. Uh, that's our structure. Uh, and it's just moving uh, along the dots over here and along the dots over here. The distance between the uh, focal point of the Gaussian beam and the substrate is pretty large. So at the end, of, uh, I'll probably okay, I'll probably repeat this uh, again. It's possible. So, oops, that's not good. Uh, so at the end, you can see that the particle somehow disappears. And that disappearance means that the Brownian motion decreased a lot, uh, which means that the, at the end of the motion it, it was trapped by some particles, uh, by some two nanoparticles. But during the motion it works uh, uh, pretty well. So you can quite clearly see that there is a suppression of Brownian motion. And uh, there is another uh, uh, movie where the particles moves much, much closer to the substrate. So it's probably 0.5 micron or something. And the jumps are pretty visible, and the Brownian motion is much less, so the, the particle is not as bright uh, uh, as you can see. It's actually difficult to see 200 uh, nanometer bits, much easier to, to see 1 micrometer bits, and th that's why most of the calculations in the paper were done for 1 micrometer. But uh, still, 200 nanometers can be trapped, uh, and trapped very well by the light of the size of 1 micron. Um, uh, so uh, that's how the big uh, uh, particle moves uh, in, in the, uh, uh, the same uh, arrangement. So this is the, again, structure, that's the substrate, uh, and that's the uh, bit of 6 micrometer moved in the viscous oil, which is, as I said, it's pretty fast uh, if, if you look at it. The drag force which acts on this particle is, is, is really large. Uh, strangely enough, when you move it close to the surface, so you focus close to the surface, uh, some strange effects happen for obvious reasons. So that's, you, you see, you can see quite clearly the structure over there. So that means that we are pretty much close to the surface. And uh, instead of like moving the particle, it's start uh, dissecting it like a scalpel. So instead of being tweezers, you can get close to the nanostructure, you, you, can, you can make a, a scalpel, nanoscalpel or whatever. So you can, you, you can cut it pretty easily, uh, the structure, if you want. Uh, and as I said, it's pretty, pretty clear that you, we are much closer to the uh, surface over here than over here. And when you increase power even more, uh, 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 another bizarre thing happens. You will have a bubble produced uh, uh, on the material. That bubble in itself, uh, I, I will talk about these bubbles uh, a bit later, uh, is pretty interesting. Uh, it's somehow trapped by the light, uh, which again, kind of intuitive. I've told you that whatever got n less refractive index less than 1, it shouldn't be trapped. But in this particular case, it is trapped uh, by, by, by the light. And uh, uh, there are some strange, uh, I'll show you once again, there are some 
so th there is nothing changes over here. So it's just a, a you know, bubble over here, and that's particle of one micron, and that's particle six micron. And strangely enough, we've got auto auto motion uh, of this particle. And as soon as we removed it away, auto motion disappears. And it, but when it's far away, it somehow breaks it and in, put in inside the, uh, this uh, uh, bubble uh, produced in, in the oil. Okay, uh, so. Uh, we studied these optical nanobubbles uh, uh, quite a lot because uh, when we put something interesting, uh, as I said, counterintuitive, when something is trapped, uh, which is, should not be trapped, uh, it, it is interesting. So again, uh, you put this uh, double pillar rays, and uh, we found that if you measure the vo uh, radius of the, of the bubble uh, as a function uh, of time, uh, then it, it behaves strangely. Uh, there is, first of all, some uh, threshold power at which this bubble appears. And as soon as it appears, it grows immediately to some constant value and doesn't change after that at all. And then if you switch, so that's the place where the power was gone. And then when you switch power, it just decays to some time of, of, of the decay. And the, the, the most deductive thing is that the smaller the size of the, of the uh, nanodots, the smaller the initial bubble. So actually, we can produce bubbles as the size is one micron uh, at the threshold. I mean, for for, for this one, uh, you can quite clearly see it's like ten microns or something. But uh, as I said, if, if the dots are small, the threshold uh, bubble size would be like one micron. It would be like something over here. Uh, another pretty strange thing: this bubble is trapped in offside position. So that's the bubble, and that's the position of the laser light. So it's, it, it cannot be trapped, obviously, by, by the set of the uh, Gaussian beam, because uh, the, you cannot predict the theory. But uh, uh, it is still trapped somehow, and it's probably connected with the convection motion of the oil, because the power here is, 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 is pretty large. Okay, so uh, uh, if you look at the motion of this bubble, it, it, it's also pretty so you, you can move them easily uh, again uh, using the uh, motion of the uh, either laser beam or substrate. So previously I showed you how substrate, uh, how laser beam moved uh, bubbles. Uh, sorry, not bubbles, but beads. But uh, this time I'll show you how by moving substrate you can uh, uh, move bubbles with respect to substrate. And the motion is pretty fast. Believe me, it's like uh, I mean again hundreds of microns per second, pretty easily. Uh, so I'll show you another picture. And as soon as you go away from the uh, uh, substrate, uh, the bubble disappears. So th there is probably some, 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 some interesting physics in it. So you, you can probably generate something small and then trap using the bubble with something small good uh, to the places which you can't do otherwise. For example, you can move uh, metallic particles uh, uh, using this uh, 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 So. Uh, Nanobubble production, there is no proper theory yet. Uh, it's difficult to decide what is responsible. The, the easy uh, answer is heat, so that, that the heat produced you the amount of boiled oil which gives you a bubble. But there is a couple of other possibilities. The electric breakdown could be one, or if you calculate the amount of electromagnetic stress in between these nanopillars, it is huge for the powers used. So uh, it's, it, it's not clear. And uh, for the bubbles, the trap efficiency is even larger than the, for, for, for the nanobits. Uh, strangely enough, there is a strong dependence, as I said, of the bubble formation on the geometry of the pillar pair. So if you look at the, uh, so that's for three different uh, uh, pillar pairs of structure. Uh, so that, that's the diameter, 100, 115, 127. So the change of the, just 20% in the diameter of the uh, pillars. But that means that the, for example, th threshold uh, for the bubble formation changed four times. And the size of the bubble diameter is changing seven times for just 20% change of the uh, uh, diameter of the pillar. So it's probably connected somehow with near fields, but we, we still don't understand how. And the uh, trap efficiency is huge for the bubbles somehow. Again, it's, it's strange because the bubbles should not be trapped by the, by the light. Uh, so we'll, we'll make I'll make general remarks on nanotwism. Uh, you can see if, if you make a uh, nanostructure substrate, you can basically use them in almost any kind of uh, optical physics stuff, and you can trap uh, uh, small objects better 
than without this uh, nano structured substrate. So probably at some point, almost any uh, installation, optical thesis installations, would have something like that with time. Uh, so uh, Dragonis volume of the structure is really subwave lens. We've seen Trapan with the accuracy of 100 nanometers for, for this kind of laser, and that, that's a good result, so hopefully it will be used uh, at some point also. Trapping efficiency is high as well. Uh, ideally, we would like to trap a uh, metallic particle and put it in between two other metallic particles and to see how uh, we can increase progressively the uh, electromagnetic field from, from two different sides of uh, particles. And uh, the traffic force is strongly enhanced, uh, so one can trap particles much smaller uh, uh, light power. So that could probably help to trap biological objects, which, uh, as we all know, are pretty fragile. And uh, I think I've showed you that we've got about 10 uh, fold suppression of chronium motion, which means that we can trap particles better. And the terminal velocity is 40 times larger during the nanostructure substrate, because th that is the important bit, because you can say that uh, what happens near this to nanoparticle is that there is a mechanical, uh, how to say, uh, mechanical uh, trapping of the particle. It's not optical one, but because the terminal velocity is much much larger, it means that it can't be just only mechanical uh, trapping. And because of all these nice things we can say about uh, nanotwism, uh, the next thing obviously is to take uh, thermonuclear pellet, pellet and try to, to make uh, fusion in between the nanoparticle and nanostructure, which is probably a good idea to try. Uh, I'll show you the slide, that, that's our latest thing, uh, on the uh, field amplification. Uh, so by making the nanostructure, you can, and proper nanostructure, you can achieve very high uh, fluorescence enhancement. That's our last uh, work, which we'll, we'll try to describe sooner or later. Uh, and as, as an N over here stands for Center, uh, Manchester Center for Mesoscience and Nanotechnology. And at the end of uh, my talk, uh, I'll try to show uh, uh, this center where all the structures were, were made. And this center was uh, opened, I think, uh, in 2005 or 2004 by Lord Salisbury. And now it's got pretty good uh, uh, nanofabrication facilities. So we've got uh, Leores. Uh, uh, deposition, uh, oh sorry, uh, lithography uh, installation, and we've got pretty good the uh, spattering system, uh, uh, which allows you to, to make something on the big scale reproducible. It's, I have to say, it's pretty costly at the moment, but as soon as you know what kind of structure you need to achieve, then you can probably think about printing and make the same things uh, much cheaper. So whoever wants to work over there, th think about it. So at the end, what I would like to say is so thank you for, for your attention. I think that plasmonics and nanoptics opened a uh, very new and exciting field of investigation. Though I, I, well, I would agree with the one that sometimes it's just name calling, so you will name the same thing by different name. And thank you very much for your patience and uh, attention. Bye.
strange thing about gold nanoparticles, somehow it stick to them, but that can be easily moved to another trap, because probably the trap is so strong that it's like you can take out the nanoparticle from the previous uh, position. So possibly, uh, I, 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 I mentioned that it's possible that mechanical things are playing some role in this, in this process, but it's still interesting that even if you have the mechanical forces, you'll be able to drag it away with high speeds, like 100 micrometers per second, easily, without no problem whatsoever. Try to do that to put me a particle near the surface of the substrate using this construct, you, you, you will be able to do that. And uh, uh, if you ever done the nanotubism experiments, you will see a dead nanoparticles at the uh, substrate surface in the millimeter. So as soon as it hits the surface, it's end of the story, we pick up another one. But not in the case of the from the surface, from the surface. Yeah, so you know, uh, uh, you could increase the volume of chat in conventional chat by increasing laser power. Yeah, yeah. So of course. What, but in here, you know, what kind of dependence on laser power you observe? Is it linear? Okay. It's okay. It's okay. okay. But the, the, th the good thing about it, if you take two nanoparticles close together, the near field inside will be about what, 20 times larger than the near field out of that the open field. So if you transfer that to intensity, it will give you about 400, 500 times increase in the intensity in the field of the particle. So the trap itself would be 500 times better than the trap outside. So you can decrease power about from the trap if you want. That, that's why I think it's possible to draft some biological options to use that kind of idea. And then, if you can, like, trap on the DNA and then put it in between an nanoparticle and measure how immediately with that, it would be great. I'm not sure if it's possible. You can read the, like, DNA sequencing by using two nanoparticles just by moving them in between. It's, it's like uh, fiction. Harry Potter book, but... Yeah. Are there more questions? Uh, no more questions. Um, uh, okay, so let's uh, thank our speaker. Uh, so it, it looks like our summer school is coming to the end. Uh, usually.